one. Thanks. All right, folks. Well, we are just getting started here for the Student Learning and Wellbeing Committee meeting. Um, I hope everyone's audio is functioning properly and your video, if you experience any um, delays, please try turning off your video. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Jennifer Reddy and I'm your chair for this meeting. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm joining you from the unceded territories of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Um, and part of my um, territorial opening, I wanted to mention uh, two uh, actions that are shared by Bob Joseph, especially at this time of unrelenting grief. Um, wanted to share these two actions. Uh, one reads um, specifically about reading the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report. And the second is about taking action on any of the calls to action. So it reads, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada released their calls to action in 2015. So far, only 10 have been met. So please read the full document and continue to practice the actions toward reconciliation, share with friends and family. Um, so just an invitation there uh, for two actions that we can take. Um, in addition, I wanted to acknowledge um, the uh, killing of four uh, Muslim family members in Ontario and recognize the um, additional toll and grief that that is taking on um, staff and student communities as well. And just want to acknowledge um, space that folks might need on this call as um uh, we're going through the items today um, to please take care of yourselves and also um, please reach out for support. Our superintendent has offered that students, um, as always, can reach out to um, administrators and staff uh, in schools. Um, and so please uh, do reach out for support and offer support where you can. Uh, and so with that, I wanted to um, just go over meeting decorum and then roll call, uh, just so we know who's on the line. And please note that the meeting is being live streamed and the audio and visual recording is available to the public for viewing after the meeting, which is also viewed inside and outside of Canada. So for meeting decorum, um, please note that um, this uh, board has a strong commitment to ethical conduct, and this includes the responsibility of committee members to conduct themselves with appropriate decorum and professionalism. Myself, as chair of the committee, um, it's my responsibility to see that decorum is maintained, and I ask for your help in making sure that all members and delegates request to speak through the chair, that we exercise civility towards others, um, and is that 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 is maintained as stakeholder representatives and trustees share perspectives and participate in debate, that staff are able to submit objective reports without influence or pressure as their work is acknowledged and appreciated, that committee members refrain from personal inflammatory, accusatory language and action, and that committee members, trustees, representatives and staff present themselves in professional and courteous manner. So thank you for your support in that. So I will call your name, so please unmute and let us know that you're here. I'll start with trustees on the committee. Trustee Parrott? Yes, Chair, I'm here. Thank you. Welcome. Trustee Cho? Present, Chair. Thank you. Welcome. Trustee Fraser? Here. Thank you, Chair. Welcome. And other trustees that may be on the line, Trustee Ballantyne? Trustee Chan Pedley? Trustee Gonzalez? I'm here, thank you. Great, welcome. Uh, Trustee Hansen? And Trustee Wong? Present Chair, thank you. Great, welcome. And also uh, Superintendent Hoffman? I'm here, thank you, Chair. Great, and Secretary Treasurer David Green? I'm here, Madam Chair, thank you. Great, welcome. Okay, uh, how about Student Trustee Ricky Huang? Okay. Uh, senior management staff, so just going down the list here, uh, Carmen Batista. I'm present, thank you, Chair. Great. Pedro Da Silva. I'm present, thank you, Chair. Super. Jody Langua. Present, Chair, thank you. Great. How about David Nelson? Yeah, I'm present, Chair. Great. And Rob Schindel? Present, thank you, Chair. Great. And uh, Trina Goliath, VSTA. 
Thanks, Trustee Reddy. I'm here. Thanks. Welcome. Great. How about Joanne Sutherland from Vesta? Uh, yep, yeah, I'm here. Thank you very much, Chair. Great. And Damien Willman from VASA? Uh, David Dix uh, representing VASA tonight. Thank you, Chair. Great. Welcome, David. Um, how about Shannon Burton from VEPFA? Actually, this is Mark Cormack uh, representing VEPFA today. Great. Welcome, Mark. How Thank about you. Scott Dale from PASA? Present. Thank you, Chair. Great. Krista Sigurdsson from DPAC. Yes, thank you. Here, Chair. Great. Uh, Cynthia Schatt from QP15. It's um, Marisa Dikiakos from QP15 uh, representing QP15 tonight. Thanks, Chair. Great. Welcome, Marisa. How thank about you. Harjeet Kangura from IUOE? Present. Thank you, Chair. Great. Neil Monroe from Trades. Uh, Brent Boyd from QP407. And how about Catherine Diang, sorry, Diakano from VDSC? Present here, thank you. Great, welcome Catherine. Did I say your name correctly? Yeah, Catherine Diakano. <laughs> Diakano, thank you, appreciate it. Okay, um, and then for other staff, I wanted to check in with uh, Aaron Davis. Present chair, thank you. Great, Alison Ogden. Present chair, thank you. Super, Chris Stanger. Present Chair, thank you. Great. Chaz Desjardins. Present Chair. Hi, Chika. Great. And David Delorme. Present Chair, thank you. Great. And anyone else that's staff or uh, reps that I've missed? Okay. So I think we got everybody. Um, and you'll notice on the agenda that um, it is fairly packed. Um, more than uh, compared to usual, but uh, this is our last Student Learning and Wellbeing Committee meeting. Um, and so for that reason, we have uh, several delegations as well as information items. I will ask Shamira uh, for your help in keeping time. Uh, so for delegations, we have six delegations, um, each with five minutes to speak. And so you will hear a bell to indicate your time. And that's to allow for the next person to speak, but also for the committee and stakeholders to ask questions. Um, um, and understand uh, the points that you're raising. Uh, with the exception of the first delegation, which requires interpretation, will allow additional time for interpretation of uh, your presentation, but also questions that may come forward. So uh, without delay, I'd love to welcome uh, ELL program by Stephanie Angel Gary. Thank you. And this includes Beatrice, uh, Sammy, Mariella, Juliana, and Alex Yahir. And please correct me if I uh, mistake any of your names. And we're ready to start uh, when you're ready. Is our delegation on the line? Or maybe my audio is not functioning. Hello, so Chair, I, I don't think it's your audio because I can't hear anything okay. either. So Taylor, okay. are you able to help us or Sarah with the audio for the delegations? Stephanie, I think I see you. I can't actually hear you, Stephanie, but you are unmuted. So we'll just uh, ask for some assistance. Um, we'll call Stephanie, is your audio working now? Okay. 
no problem. Uh, we will help you with that. Okay, I will try that. One second. Great, we can we can hear you. Can now. you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I have a PowerPoint. So if I could have the first slide, and then I'll get started. Thank you. So hi, my name is Stephanie. I'm the Latin American Youth Worker at Britannia Community Center. I have been working with a group of parents and youth who are currently or have been in the ELL program in Vancouver. And some of them have had some challenges um, during their, their time completing or, or exiting ELL. And they are here today to present and share with you their experience, hoping to find a way to create change so that future ELL students are able to get more support and have a higher chance at academic success. The presenters that we have here today are Beatriz Eugenia Cerecedo Figueroa and Natalia Figueroa, Sammy Guevara, Mariela Rojas Farias, Juliana Flores Montoya, Alex Jair Castillo. And next slide, please. And I'll just quickly go over. So we have a quick summary of some of the challenges that um, Latin American ELL students are often faced with. So point number one, the ELL program takes too long for students to master the language. Some of the ELL students in ELL, one, have difficulty graduating. The staying in ELL for four to five years has a negative impact on students' academic success. And ELL students often fall behind in their academic courses since ELL content is often too basic. And students often feel isolated while attending ELL programs. And lastly, there seems to be no structure or consistency in how ELL courses are being taught. So I'll go to the next slide. So we have come up with three requests that we think will help to find ways to better understand these challenges and hopefully create change to better support the students. Um, so our first request is, uh, we would like to see a report on Dotwood graduation rates for high school students, to segregated by country of origin, home language, and by, by, high, by school, including high school as well as adult education for the past five years. And we will also like the Vancouver School Board to create a survey for ELL students and their parents to see how long it takes for students to exit the ELL program. And this way we want to find out whether ELL students are experiencing isolation, lack of self-esteem and depression due to the length of time that they're having to stay in ELL, as well as other questions that might shed light on how ELL is impacting the academic learning of students and their sense of well-being. And lastly, we would like the Vancouver School Board to hire an, exter an external committee language accusation experts to revise the current ELL program taught at the Vancouver School Board and to make recommendations aligned with the new curriculum in BC so that students can integrate faster into the regular classrooms. So um, those are our three requests and once again, thank you for this opportunity, and I will pass it on to our presenter, Beatriz and Natalia. Hello, my name is Natalia Cruz. Um, my mom, unfortunately, can't be here. Um, she is in a different meeting, so I'll be doing my speech. Um, I was part of the ELL program, and I joined this um, this group um, that we're trying to, you know, change, um, you know, the program in general, because um, I didn't honestly, I didn't feel enoughly supported during my time in the program. So I'll I'll read you my speech. Um, I am a senior at McGee Secondary School, 
and I want to talk to you about changing the ELL program structure. This is very important to me. Um, and although I'm not in the ELL program anymore, uh, it's still a huge concern of mine that the ELL program uh, taught me little to nothing, um, as I recall. And I want this. I want to prevent prevent sorry this from happening to students in the future. I got out of the ELL program because of extracurricular curricular opportunities. I I had like classes outside and I had um, a school before coming into the to my school um, that taught me only English. And back in Mexico, I had uh, different opportunities. My first ever school was bilingual. So I, I did come with to Canada with some English experience. But this is not the case for a lot of students and a lot of students um, don't have the enough English to get out of the ELL program fast uh, and they don't learn. Um, this shouldn't happen. I, sh I shouldn't have just gotten out of the ELL program because of my uh, previous experience. Uh, I feel like um, the students haven't given, haven't been given enough resources to advance um, in the school. I didn't feel uh, that my time during the ELL program was, um, yeah, I, I just didn't feel enough, if not fully supported. Um, I would come to class to copy on my notebook, just as the book said. Uh, it was just copy, paste, copy, paste. And honestly, I didn't learn anything from copying and pasting. There, there wasn't any teachers giving a class during my ELL time. And if there was a teacher giving a class, we would fill a book uh, with two basic of a level in English for me and two difficult um, of, of level in English for others. So it's uh, on equivalent and we don't learn as we, we don't give out our full potential. Um, I started in level three of ELL, and if this is how the program is, what happens to the students that start in the lowest level of, you know, without support? Um, I just ask for you to um, to read our petition, and I believe the school board is responsibility is to support our students no matter no matter where they come from. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Natalia. And is Beatrice joining you as well, or? Um, I'm, oh, sorry, there. Um, unfortunately, she can't. Uh, she, I think she's having a test and a meeting or something like that. She's also a student, but she was very worried, you know, both her daughters are were in the ALL program. And we didn't really feel, um, yeah, just like, it, it just wasn't, you know, enough. Um, so we're here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that too. And Stephanie, uh, is that everyone on your list as well? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, uh, Stephanie. We so, have yeah. we have more presenters though. So. Uh, okay. So we'll just give you a time check in a few minutes, just to make sure we have questions for uh, from the committee back to uh, your delegation and. Okay. Uh, as well, we have uh, other delegations, so I will just keep track of that. But whoever's going next, uh, please, whenever you're ready, we're ready for you. Okay. I believe next we have Mariela. Mariela, are you online? Yes. Okay. Um, you can go ahead. I think we can hear you. You can hear me? Yes. Now? It's just a little bit softer, so if you can come closer to your microphone, maybe. And now? Yes. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Mariela Rojas. I came here in 2019. I have three kids in the public schools in Vancouver. 
we are in grades 5th, 11th and 12th respectively. Um, I have learned from some people of this group that some of the youth that study in ELL courses do not feel engaged to their learning since the level 1 and 2 are too basic and demands no effort for them. It is not the case of my three kids because they are in an extraordinary school in the UBC neighborhood. In this school, the majority of the students come from Asian countries and have the privilege of having private lessons where they can practice and learn the English language in a most accurate way. But I have also learned that some young immigrant students drop out from high school since they feel frustrated and because the classes are not challenging enough, for instance, they are slow, they are not taught, taught by language experts, they use a lot of the technique technique of cutting and pasting from the readings they do in classes and they concentrate mostly on writing and reading skills instead of speaking skills and because they feel they are not in the correct group I mean the age of study they share classes with younger kids and it is a bit, bit discouraging for them so they fall behind in attaining post-secondary post education we as Latin American parents would like you to consider the possibility of doing a research or survey about the facts I described before. We also think you should think about redesigning the ELL lessons to a new form of teaching, hopefully done by professional ESL teachers, so these kids can keep on going with the mastery of the English language. The classes should be more interesting, engaging and challenging for them. We know that with a few adaptations, we could create huge changes in the numbers of discouraged Latin American students from dropping off from the secondary, secondary education. I must say that I really appreciate your time to listen to us today because we're really looking forward to finding a solution for the young immigrants from Latin America. I, the same as my partners here, feel much appreciation from this country and especially this province that has welcomed us all. But we still think more efforts could be done to improve the conditions of the younger generations to avoid all the negative consequences of having disengaged learners. Thank you. Thank you, Mariela. Really appreciate your presentation and uh, Natalia and Stephanie as well. Um, so that uh, our timer went and I'm just asking uh, Stephanie, is there anyone else in your group? Yes, we have three more presenters. We have Juliana, Alex and Sammy. Okay, is five minutes more enough so that we can go to questions from committee as well? Um, I believe so. I think the next three people, uh, their presentations are pretty brief. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay, so when you're ready uh, for the next ones. Okay, Juliana, are you connected? Yes. <laughs> um, eh, hola a todos. Soy Juliana Flores Montoya. Hoy les quiero contar un poco sobre mi familia. Primero resalto que estar en Canadá es algo importante para mi familia y para mí. Um, um, hello everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Juliana Flores Montoya and um, I want to tell you a little bit about my family, but I, I need to highlight um, that Canada is something very important for my family and for me. Sabemos que el sistema educativo de Canadá es uno de los mejores del mundo. Puede repetir, perdón. Sabemos que el sistema ah, educativo en Canadá okay. es uno de los mejores del mundo. So we know that uh, Canada, Canada's educational system is one of the best in the world. Sin embargo, la incursión de los niños de habla hispana al idioma inglés presenta debilidades que ameritan ser resaltadas en este espacio. Um, however, um, the incursion of Spanish-speaking children into uh, the English language presents weaknesses um, that uh, uh, need to be highlighted in this space. Tengo dos niños en edades diferentes con situaciones particulares para cada uno. So I have two children of different ages with uh, particular situations for each one. 
Mi hijo mayor Samuel tiene 16 años y se encuentra estudiando en John Oliver Secondary School en ELL2. Uh, my oldest son Samuel is 16 years old and he's studying at John Oliver Secondary School in ELL2. Tiene una clase de reading y dentro de esta clase debe leer algunos libros y exponer. Sin embargo, no recibe ningún tipo de retroalimentación de las actividades realizadas. Um, he has a, a reading class and uh, within this class he has to read some books and um, expose or present. Um, however, he does not receive any kind of feedback from, uh, from his activities. El proceso de aprendizaje del idioma inglés representa para él una barrera para socializar con otros adolescentes. So the, the process of learning English, uh, the English language represents a barrier for him to uh, be able to socialize with other teenagers. Además del hecho de ser una incertidumbre si logre concluir todos los créditos para su graduación con los niños de su edad. So um, in addition to the fact that there is um, uncertainty about whether uh, he will be able to complete all the credits for his graduation with um, other students his age. Mi hija Sara tiene ocho años y asiste al John Henderson Elementary School. My daughter Sarah is eight years old and she attends John Henderson Elementary. Siendo más complejo su proceso de adaptación, pues no cuenta con ningún tipo de acompañamiento para el aprendizaje del idioma inglés. So her um, process of adaptation is more complex because she does not have any kind of support for learning the English language. En su proceso de formación han ocurrido ciertos hechos que la han entristecido como son. Uh, in uh, the process of uh, instruction, certain events have happened to her that have uh, saddened her. Primero, as... primero, la no integración de mi niña con otros niños hace que ella se sienta excluida y sin amigos. So first, um, the, the non-integration of my girl uh, with other children makes her feel excluded and, and without friends. Segundo, dentro del grupo de clase hay un niño de la misma edad de mi hija que habla español. So second, uh, within the class group, there is a boy uh, who is the same age as my daughter who speaks Spanish. A quien responsabilizaron de las traducciones y explicaciones de todas las actividades que se desarrollan en clase. So um, he has been responsible for the translations and all the explanations of uh, the activities that take place in the class. En mi opinión, no creo que este niño de, debería encargarse de este proceso. So, in my opinion, I don't think that this uh, child should be in charge of that process. Tercero, para mi familia y para mí, es importante que mi hija aprenda el inglés, pero en la escuela tienen otras prioridades conforme la programación académica. So, third, um, it is important for my family and for me that, that my daughter learns English. Uh, but at, at school, they have other priorities according to the academic uh, schedule. Como podrán observar, el problema del idioma, además de generar una barrera en los procesos de comunicación, puede convertirse en un problema de salud mental de los niños. So, um, as you can see, um, the problem of language, in addition to uh, generating a, a barrier of uh, in communication processes, can also become a, a mental health problem for children. Por lo, ta, por lo que implica un trabajo conjunto entre los padres, las instituciones educativas y el gobierno. So, um, this will need um, a joint worker effort between parents, um, educational institutions and the government. Así las cosas, me uno a la solicitud de cambio planteado por el Comité de Familias Latinoamericanas y líderes comunitarios por el éxito de los estudiantes ELL latinoamericanos de BCB. Esperando que este proceso se logre grandes cosas. Muchas gracias. So, um, as things stand, I joined the request for change raised by uh, the Committee of the Latin American um, Families and Community Leaders uh, for the success of the Latin American ELL students. Um, and I hope that uh, great things will be achieved from, from this uh, space. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juliana, for sharing uh, your experience with your family and uh, also for the interpretation. I uh, really appreciate that. And Stephanie, is that our last one then?
We just have one minute left uh, for this set of delegations. Okay, so we just have one more presenter and the next person will be Sami Guevara. Sami, are you online? Hi, yes. Welcome, Sami, when you're ready. Yes. Hi, my name is Laura Samantha and I'm Mexican. I'm 16 years old and I study at David Thompson Secondary School. I came to Canada in 2016 and I, I study only two months of grade six. has been very difficult for me. At the beginning, I had to live with children of different ages to mine, which made me feel estranged from my group. The ELL process is very slow and does not allow me to integrate in some subjects such as social studies and science. Integration is difficult. For example, some level one students know the topics well and others of the same level do not know them. This make these, sorry. This makes me go behind. In, sorry, <laughs> integration is difficult. For example, some level one students know the topics well and others of the same level do not know them. This makes the events students lag behind and become a bit dis disparate. Perhaps the division between the students should be different and have teachers specialize in language training to speed up the process. The classes, in addition to programs, should be more focused on reality and practice, bringing the student closer to daily coexistence in the language, not only with our family, but also when we are away from home. For example, when we, when ordering something in a store or restaurant, or simply when begin, when we begin with other children. I think that moving away from, from children who are native English speakers as slows down learning. When they mix us with other students who do not speak English well and do, and do it with an accent of their own language. It is lows the learning of speaking. In case it was useful, in my case, it was useful to be in boys and girls clubs. Since my parents do not have the resources of being a tutor, getting to transitional has been a long road of almost five years, but when you get there, there are regular classes, and some classes are difficult because they are regular. So the native English language, it's not as the same as the yellow classes. So if we had more practice with the people that do speak English, it would be more easy for the people that go to transitional because we are not as usual with the language, with the harder words as ELL because they use more practical words that are easier to understand. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Sammy, uh, for sharing your personal experience as well. And uh, for Stephanie and the rest of the delegation, um, Juliana and Mariela and Natalia, uh, for sharing. So I'd like to open it up to questions from our 
uh, stakeholders and committee representatives, starting with Trustee Parent. Thank you, Chair. I wonder if somebody can describe for us the ELL program as it exists now. I know how it operates or operated in elementary schools, but I'm not sure about how it operates in secondary schools. Thanks, Trustee Parrott. And is that a question for the any any one of the delegates? Or or for any of the staff that's that's there? Thanks, Trustee Parrott. So if uh, anyone wants to jump in, feel free. And also, if you'd like to ask a question or comment, please let me know in the chat. I know a little bit of, I know a lot about the ELL program, but I think Claudia, if Claudia feels comfortable, she might be able to explain it in more detail than I can. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Stephanie. And I will uh, just note that I think Superintendent Hoffman uh, might be ready here. Okay. Thank you, uh, Chair Reddy. My suggestion through to Trustee Parrott and her question is that perhaps staff could put a package together for trustees on the committee and the stakeholders at this committee. The response is fairly comprehensive to provide all of the answers about the programming that is currently taking place. So that would be my advice for the purpose of this committee meeting, Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Suzanne. That's really helpful, and I think that would be appreciated by everyone. Um, and also open for other questions or comments from committee stakeholders. I have a question myself, and this was, um, I'm not sure if Stephanie or any of the delegation uh, representatives could answer, um, was just around, uh, are there any specific um, kind of needs that you're noticing? It sounds like we're mostly talking about some elementary and high school, but I was curious about online learning like VLN or adult education. Um, uh, are some of these experiences also reflected in experiences with adult education or online learning, or is that uh, kind of outside of what you're speaking to? And Stephanie, do you think anyone uh, would like to answer that or it's okay if, if not? Sorry, can you repeat your question? Yes, uh, just if the experiences shared also reflect in any adult education learning or online learning, or if it's mostly elementary and secondary that uh, you're focused on. Uh, based on the uh, presenters that we have today, everyone is in high school and they have been going, going to classes in person and now with COVID online. But um, aside from the people that are here today, we have also had um, older youth that come to the country at say age 17 to 18, who have had to go to adult education in order to finish their high school credits. And um, they have also had different challenges adapting to the high, um, the adult education learning style since they seem to go a lot faster. And in many cases, um, once they go into the adult education system, they're placed at a higher level of English where when they were in high school, say in level one, they will go almost into like a level three in adult learning. So there seems to be... Um, like it, their, their, their way of um, testing the language seems to be very different between high school and um, adult learning. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate the added information. And just wondering, Suzanne, if that report back, I noticed there was a question in the chat uh, that it would be shared with um, stakeholders, but also if there are connections to the adult education piece, uh, that would be helpful. And I'm noticing, I think, okay, so I don't see any other questions or comments. Sorry, I think Natalia or, Cruz has a question. She has her hand up. Yep, go ahead, Natalia. Hi, um, 
Well, my mom, I don't know if you guys have time, but my mom is um, is finally here and she was very looking forward to, to present, if that's okay. It'll just take um, a little bit. Hi, Natalia. Um, yes, we do have uh, several other delegations and we're already 40 minutes in. So I just want to respect the time of other people who are waiting to speak. Uh, would it be possible to also have uh, something written if others would like to have their voice uh, heard by the committee? Maybe we can put it together and follow up. Uh, Suzanne, would that be OK to request this from the delegates? Um, thank you, Chair. It would be perfectly uh, fine to receive any written information that they have, and I would like to reissue the invitation to the group to meet with Bruce Garnett, who is our district principal um, of our ELL program, so that some of the issues can be dealt with directly with staff from the ELL team. And I do want to just acknowledge, I, I realize that some individuals had concerns, but to recognize the very fine work that our teachers do to support our English language learners, any concerns that individuals do have, we have to follow up. But I also want to know that they do want the committee to know that we appreciate the work that they do do. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Suzanne, uh, and thanks to all the delegates for speaking on this issue. Uh, and of course, as Suzanne mentioned, we would love to receive any written feedback, but also there are future committee meetings. Uh, so we're always open to hear uh, feedback and uh, information ideas. And also thank you for your courage for sharing your personal challenges, uh, recognizing how difficult that is. Um, but the connections you made to the differences in needs across the board, that there isn't really a... Uh, one size fits all, but also there's some needs like mental health and academic achievement that are shared with all students. So I really want to thank you on behalf of our committee for taking the time to speak with us and having the courage to do that. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And I would like to call uh, up next Rebecca Dial, if you're ready. It's okay to request this from the delegates. Um, thank you, Chair. If you could mute, uh, uh, mute your yeah. live feed. Thanks. So, Rebecca, when you're ready, if you could mute your live feed and then unmute, then we're ready uh, to hear you as soon as you're ready. Perfect. Can you hear me? Perfect. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak with you tonight. I am truly grateful to live, work, play, and send my kids to school on the ancestral lands of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. My name is Rebecca Diel, and I have three daughters who attend French immersion at Carisdale Elementary. I'm also a pediatrician and work in the area of pediatric hematology oncology. I'm joined by more than 40 concerned parents tonight on the live stream, and I'm here to speak with you about my eldest daughter, Alice. Although I didn't know it at the start, my daughter has some special learning needs. In early elementary, she cruised by and wasn't until about grade four that we started to realize she wasn't really meeting her full potential. She was asked by teachers not to put her hand up in class so often. She became bored at school. She started to not always fit in with her peers. She started to lose some of the joy and love for learning. But my first message tonight is one of immense gratitude. A caring teacher noticed that Alice needed something more than what she was able to offer in her regular classroom. Alice completed some testing and ultimately was given a learning designation and offered a place in Caresdale's French Immersion Multi-Age Cluster Class or MAC program. Over the past two years, Alice's love of learning has taken off. She comes home in the evening excited to read more about her projects or to complete more extensions and engage with her peers. She's fully accepted by her classmates as herself and even celebrated for her uncanny knowledge of Greek mythology and space facts. She's been allowed to accelerate in math and has become fascinated by Canadian space history. She's particularly interested in the path of women in science, engineering, and space exploration. She's learned how to be a leader. She's learned how to stand up for what she believes in. This past year was hard on her, as it was on all of us. As both my husband and I are frontline healthcare workers, she was left home without educational support for those early months in 2020. She tried to keep busy, stay engaged, and became the primary teacher for her younger sisters with online school tasks. She started the process of decision-making for high school well over a year ago. Due to the pandemic, the application processes were particularly stressful, with multiple rounds of virtual testing and exams in multiple subject areas and interviews with each of the schools she applied to. Ultimately, she was lucky to have great options to choose from in February. After much thought, pros and cons lists, and long discussions with us, we empowered her to make her own first life decisions. She gave up 
as she ultimately had to make sacrifices, but that's also a life lesson. She gave up French immersion, which she loves. She's leaving the peer cohort she's been with since kindergarten and gave up spots in another mini school with enrichment courses and at private schools. However, she was really happy with her choice to attend Hamburg Challenge Studio Mini School and the opportunity to take honors math and science classes. So you can imagine our surprise to hear in early May that Hamburg was canceling honors science. In that same email, there was reassurance that honors math had been saved. Any child interested in advanced math was offered a placement test. Meanwhile, parents launched advocacy efforts in response to the unexpected science cut. My daughter wrote her math placement test in school on May 19th, and that same afternoon, her teacher told her that Hamber had reversed its decision to save math and the class was canceled. Teachers were instructed by Hamber to dispose of the math placement tests that the kids had written. They didn't even want to see them. My daughter came home in tears that day. She was confused and upset. She didn't understand why Hamber would do this to her and her peers, and I honestly didn't know what to tell her. We had not received any information at that point from the school. And to this day, there's been no explanation for the urgency and haste that justified the late notice. We subsequently learned from multiple sources that the math cut was in direct response to widespread parent concern about the science cut. We teach our kids to stand up for what they believe in. And sadly, VSB has shown them that advocacy can result in punishment. Please excuse me for speaking honestly, but it was a slap in the face. And not just in my face, but in the faces of 12 year old children from the educators in the system that they've always trusted and respected. Although I didn't see this coming, I've now learned that the stance of the VSB and the interpretation of BC's redesigned curriculum is that there's no place for separate honors or enrichment programs on an argument of equity and inclusion. Rather than discuss ways to make these learning opportunities accessible to all who may benefit, the ideology is that teachers should rather meet the needs of all students in one class. It's a one size fits all model. Bright and otherwise capable kids also have real challenges, which are often social or emotional. They're at risk for anxiety, depression, and have difficulty with change. They're at risk for dropping out of school and being forgotten because everyone assumes they'll be just fine. As a pediatric oncologist, I often get asked why I choose to do the job I do. One of the big reasons is that it helps give me some perspective to not sweat the small stuff. As such, I've had an internal dilemma about speaking out on this issue. My daughter will probably be fine. She'll cruise by, she'll be okay. But will she lose her joy of learning? Will she still be accepted by her peers for her enthusiasm as a teenager? What about my younger daughters and the other children with special needs? Our kids were denied the opportunity to make an informed decision. I call on you tonight to reinstate these courses for the incoming grade eight students at Hamber who were caught in the crossfire. I also ask you to please provide families and students advance notice and clear communication of cuts so they can make informed decisions for their futures. If Hamber needs to cut honors classes, please tell families in the fall prior to the change, remove the classes from the course planning guide and remove the information from the mini school information website. In closing, I beg you not to discard of the amazing programs that have been a jewel in VSB's crown for so many years. We can be inclusive and equitable without denying kids access to opportunities. Equity does not mean one size fits all. Equity means ensuring we meet every student's unique learning needs. Thanks so much for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks, Rebecca. Really appreciate your time and presentation. Uh, just opening it up to committee members to pose any comments or questions. Please let me know in the chat. Sorry, just freezing up here. Um, not seeing any questions or comments. I'm just going to just double check. Sorry, uh, go ahead, Trustee Gonzalez. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson, and thank you, Rebecca, for uh, for your presentation. I'm just wondering, um, what is the status at Hamber if they've removed these courses? Uh, what is the status of the the mini that was there? I know it has changed. My son was in the original mini. He's in grade 12 now, but he was in that first um, mini that changed subsequently the year after in, in grade nine. But I'm just kind of curious. I'm a bit lost kind of what's happening uh, at the lower level classes with uh, with the mini and, and what the offer actually is for us, for those students that are seeking, you know, greater challenges in our system. I'm wondering if staff person through the chair could um, address that. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Trustee Gonzalez. Um, opening it up, if staff have an answer now, we could also take that away. 
Um, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, if I may, through you, to ask Rob Schindel, our Associate Superintendent, if he could respond to that, and if not, we can provide it to you. Yes, uh, through the Chair, um, uh, to the uh, question. Um, certainly, certainly the Honours uh, Math uh, Program offerings are separate uh, from the Challenge uh, Program. They are not inclusive as part of, uh, of the challenge, challenge Program. And uh, there are uh, course offerings uh, within a challenge, but uh, those do not include uh, honors classes. Thanks, Rob, for the added information. Trustee Gonzalez, does that answer your question? Yep, that's good. Thank you. Okay. And just looking for questions and comments for the delegation. Last call here. Okay, not seeing any additional ones. I uh, want to thank you, Rebecca, for raising uh, our attention on this issue and also for sharing your personal and also your child's um, experience. That is appreciated. Oh, sorry, I have one more question from Trustee Parrott. Go ahead, Trustee Parrott. Sorry, I, I um, got my question in too slow. I... Uh, do we know, can, can staff provide us with the reason why these programs were cut? I know it, it's probably, was a, probably a school-based decision, was it? Um, and if it was, that's, you know, that's all I need to know, was that it was a school-based decision based on staffing or whatever, but, but I'd kind of like to know. Thanks, Trustee Parrott. Is that something that Rob, either you or Suzanne could answer now? Yes, uh, through the chair, uh, thank you uh, for the question. Yes, uh, with uh, any timetable uh, uh, considerations, uh, courses that run, uh, they are school-based uh, decisions. Uh, school administration uh, works with the staff at the school um, on uh, the timetable um, as it is uh, put in place uh, for the next school year. And uh, that was the case in this instance. Thank you, Rob. And Trustee Parrott, does that answer your question? Thank you. Was it, I can, was it caused through the cuts to staffing? Uh, through uh, the chair to uh, Trustee Parrott. Uh, no, I th no, there was no uh, cuts to staffing. Um, it's uh, a whole view of the uh, courses that are offered uh, within uh, within the uh, program offerings. Um, of course, uh, with, uh, with honors uh, courses, uh, just to uh, give perspective, um, there are only uh, two uh, schools uh, in the district that are currently offering honors programs. Uh, those over the years um, um, have dwindled uh, in numbers of offerings. Um, our uh, teachers, uh, our program offerings are moving towards a more inclusive uh, a model looking at uh, differentiated instruction uh, within classes uh, to align uh, with the uh, redesigned curriculum. Okay. Thanks, Thanks for the Rob. context, Rob. Thanks, Trustee Parrott. And just a uh, last call for questions or comments. I'm just checking the chat. I don't see any can and I, wanted to. Can I just ask one question? Is that okay? Um, so, Rebecca, the questions are to you at this stage, um, and so the questions that were asked were there. Um, so I want to thank you for uh, taking time to speak with us and uh, for helping us with this discussion and gathering information. It sounds like there will be some follow-up information that we will also um, have. So thank you so much for your time and for your presentation. Uh, we really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. And can I welcome uh, Mike Gelbart next, please? So, Mike, I can see you there. Uh, are you able to hear me or open your mic? Yep, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep, perfect. So whenever you're ready, uh, you have your five minutes. Thank you. Great. Good evening. My name is Mike Gelbart. I work at the UBC Department of Computer Science as an assistant professor of teaching, which is a faculty position focused on teaching. I'm also a certified high school teacher for independent schools in BC. 
I'm here because I understand that the VSB plans to cancel honors programs, and I'd like to express my support for these programs. I don't know the exact scope of these plans, whether it's honors versus enrichment versus gifted programs versus district programs, but I hope my testimony can speak to the value of this broad category of programs. I myself went through K-12 in VSB schools, including two district programs, the Osler Mac and Point Grey Mini School. In preparation for today's presentation, I spoke with a few teachers, and I've also been teaching full-time at UBC for the last six years and reflecting on my experience. A common theme is that it's hard to teach a class with students at a wide variety of levels with respect to the subject matter, and that is certainly something I've experienced myself at UBC. The teachers I spoke to didn't have a preference for teaching honors classes versus not, and I agree, I feel the same. But between those classes, the goals change, the needs change, the homework changes, the exams change, and teaching is already hard. Teaching to a mix of students who love science more than anything in the world and students who are wondering why science is useful at all and everything in between, well, that's even harder. So I would say we need to support our kids by supporting our teachers. So if we cancel the honors programs and we realize we made a mistake, can we bring them back a few years later? I would answer with a resounding no. These programs are not just a curriculum, but they also have cultures. Take, for example, a program like Point Grey Mini School, which I attended. The mini special culture manifests through hundreds of small traditions, routines, rituals, stories, and legends, and its own particular atmosphere of joy and curiosity. And the culture lives on and the reputation lives on because the younger groups inherit it from the older ones. And it can't just be something that's stored in a bottle and then breathed into a future program. And so in my opinion, canceling these programs is an irreversible decision. And these wonderful cultures built up over years or decades may become extinct. I also wanted to share a more personal perspective on how the VSB district programs shaped my life. I'll just come clean and say I'm a nerd. I started computer programming around age 10 while in the Osler Mac class. In grade 12, I drove a Toyota RAV4 with an I Heart Math bumper sticker. And on the car CD player, I would listen to Verbal Advantage, 10 Easy Steps to a Powerful Vocabulary. I even wrote a column in the school's newspaper called Gelbart's Grievances about grammar mistakes that drove me crazy. So that's quite a nerd indeed, you might be saying to yourselves, and maybe that doesn't sound like someone who's going to have a great time at school, who knows? And yet, in all my time in the math class in Point Grey Mini, I felt 100% comfortable and just safe to be myself. And I think that's worth dwelling on for a moment. As adults, many of us probably don't feel comfortable being ourselves most of the time, and let alone take those challenging middle and high school years. So I was blessed and something really went right for me in those programs, being in those environments with like-minded peers where I could feel safe. And I think those experiences gave me the self-confidence that really became the foundation for the rest of my life. And I'm so thankful for the teachers I had and those programs that I attended. I'm not sure things would have gone the same way if I didn't attend those VSB enrichment programs. And I'm thinking of some of my fellow nerds who didn't attend those types of programs. And I noticed at school, sometimes they became bored and disengaged, and sometimes they actually hated school, which in hindsight is really heartbreaking because as adults, it's so clear that they love learning. All that said, I don't claim that these programs are perfect or perfectly aligned with the values of the day. Changes may be needed, but let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. The new BC curriculum speaks of inclusion and supporting diverse learners. And these are complex topics, and I don't have all the answers, but I do believe these enrichment programs provide much needed support for diverse learners. And I suspect there's a multitude of parents, teachers, students, and alumni who feel the same way as I do. So in conclusion, I urge the VSB to reconsider these plans to cancel enrichment programs. Once the programs are gone, something special is lost permanently. 
And kids like me will lose their safe havens and their environments that challenge them and keep them engaged. So thank you for having me here this evening. That's it for my presentation, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much for your presentation, Mike, uh, and for sharing your personal experience and impact. I would just open this up to committee members for questions and comments. And sorry, Rebecca, I'm not sure I must have missed a comment earlier. Go ahead, uh, Suzanne, when you're ready. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to clarify for both Mike and Rebecca, the previous delegation, that the district has no intention of changing any of the mini school programming that is currently in place. There seems to be a little bit of, of confusion or wondering about that. So the mini school programs that are currently offered will continue to be offered. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for the clarification, Suzanne. And any other questions or comments for our delegation? All right, um, last call there, just give folks a minute in case you'd like to make a question or comment. Okay. All right, well, thank you, Mike. We really appreciate uh, your presentation and for sharing your personal impact. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. No problem. I'd like to welcome next uh, Eric Hamber Parents Advisory Council. Are you on the line? Hi, Anne, you're now online. Great, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm just uh, waiting Great. for my colleague, Peter. I think we had a delay um, on the live feed, so we, we didn't uh, realize we we're up next. Thank you. Yes, it is a little bit delayed um, and we will start the clock uh, for five minutes when you're ready. Okay, sorry, are you able to tell if um, Peter Couch is on? There we go, Peter, we're up. Sorry, it looks, seems like there was a delay. So thank you for your patience, everyone. And can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson Reddy. Uh, good afternoon, trustees, senior staff, and all attendees. Uh, my name is, uh, is Peter Couch, and uh, I'm Eric Hamber's current PAC chair, and joining me on this call is Anne Yu, vice chair. Combined, our families have five children in the public school system, ranging from grade five through to grade 10. Before starting, I have mixed emotions. While I'm excited to have just received my second shot today and all the positive that that brings, I'm saddened and need to acknowledge the terrible news that has come to light in Kamloops. My memories as a child who played in those fields are forever changed. In my own first language, Te Reo Māori, Kia kaha, forever strong. This evening, we wanted to share our experiences on two fronts. First, as parents of students who are amongst the first at the secondary school level participating in the redesigned curriculum. And second, as parent representatives who have been fielding many questions, some of which you've heard tonight, and collecting comments from our community throughout our volunteer career at Hamber and our feeder elementary schools, which is 15 years collectively so far. We believe that the recent sudden and abrupt administrative decision has impacted a group of incoming grade eight students that will affect them academically mentally and socially in ways that we do not yet know how to measure. After hearing parents recounting stories of the effort that these kids put into considering coming to Eric Hamber from an abundance of choices, it's a shame that their very first experience at the secondary level is a negative one and that families are left without a voice in this process. To have these choices removed without notice denied these students the opportunity to apply to other academic options in the province and this leaves them unnecessarily emotionally and academically stressed. We also want to share with the committee Eric Hamber's perspective around the gradual elimination of programs in, the gener in general at the school. Hamber Pack was first attuned to the possibility of programming cuts during the school's seismic process, just the start of which predates the current PAC. While grateful that we are getting a safe school, our new school size is based on dated single source demographic data that doesn't consider future yield density in, in developments in the catchment. 
or in coordination with the City of Vancouver's Community Visioning Plan. This left our school 30% smaller. My personal involvement at the DPAC level further revealed how student headcount might be managed to meet the utilization of the smaller school. Despite direct questions on this possibility specifically, varying levels of administration explicitly told the PAC, uh, then and now, uh, and other stakeholders that choice programs will not be jeopardized in the seismic process. More recently, we have been made aware of the plan to, for a gradual elimination of programs as a result of the redesigned BC curriculum. Under the guise of equity and inclusion, the public school system has abruptly terminated programs which already had teachers staffed to deliver the courses this fall. These honors programs are meant to develop talent among young Canadians. Pulling these courses will ultimately have a detrimental impact on those students specifically who can no longer attend the classes as planned. This is also a loss for our education system in general as we forego opportunities to develop our students to compete on the world stage. How can we reasonably expect educators to tailor lesson plans for a class of approximately 30 children to benefit students at various points on the learning spectrum when the system is not designed nor held accountable to do this? Equity alludes to fairness. It is fair to give all students the opportunity to reach their full potential, regardless of their learning profile. The redesigned curriculum does not support this fundamental value. Therefore, equity will not be achieved by this new curriculum. Furthermore, there have been no assurances given that the new curriculum will be accepted by post-secondary schools outside of BC. How is this responsible planning considering the connectivity of BC to the rest of the world in this day and age? If the decision to pull the honors math and science programs at Hamburg cannot be reversed, then we ask that a champion trustee or committee member put forward a motion to complete a fully researched study to be updated and communicated to the parent community annually on key performance indicators, specifically reporting on which post-secondary institutions throughout North America will accept graduates of the redesigned curriculum and what are their post-secondary graduation rates. We realize this will take time. Thank you for this opportunity to speak and as part of our transcript submission, we'd like to include a petition that supports all that has been shared by the delegations uh, with the committee today. Anne and I are happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Peter and Anne, for your presentation on behalf of Hamburg PAC. Uh, your uh, words and, and uh, calls to action are appreciated. I want to open this up to stakeholder committee members for any questions or comments to Peter or Anne? Okay, seeing no questions or comments coming in, I'd like to thank you both, uh, Peter and Anne, and please do send in the uh, petition that you mentioned uh, with signatures. That would be appreciated. We can include it in the agenda package. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for you. your time. And next, I'd like to welcome uh, Lena Young. If, Lena, you're ready, we would uh, love to welcome you. Chair, I don't think Lena is on Teams at the moment. Um, our IT team is going to contact her, but I do see that Marie is there. If it's okay with you, we can go to her first. Thanks, Jamira. That's a great suggestion. So if Marie, you are ready, we would uh, love to welcome you and start your presentation. So that's Marie Van Netten. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Uh, when you're ready, Marie. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Marie Van Netten. I have two children who attend Nightingale Elementary School in Vancouver. I'm the granddaughter of a residential school survivor, the daughter of a 60 scoop survivor, 
and myself was a ward of the government from the years 1998 until I aged out in 2005. Sorry, excuse me. I'm what generations of abductions at the hands of the churches and the government look like. I'm what deliberate assimilation sounds like. I'm a survivor of intergenerational trauma caused by the cultural oppression, rape, murder, and genocide of my ancestors, of my family members. I'm also a proud Cree woman, a proud member of Sucker Creek First Nations, and a proud mother. My children are the first generation in a long line that will not be taken away from their homes. My ask to you today, my challenge for you today, is that at least one trustee stop and bring forward a motion to immediately, this needs to be done now, contact, advocate to the provincial government to stop all public funding to private religious schools, most importantly, private Catholic schools. The bodies of 215 children were discovered in an unmarked grave on the grounds of a Catholic residential school. We are well past the time for something to be done. We all knew this had happened. No more silence is allowed. Those children, those babies in this land were stolen. Land acknowledgements, orange shirts days, they will no longer matter unless work is being done. It's time to stop public funding to an institution that contributed and was responsible in the murder of countless Indigenous children of mine and my children's relatives. The Vancouver School Board and you as a trustee and stakeholder have an opportunity to be a leader for this act of reconciliation, to apologize and stand up against the atrocities committed against generations of Indigenous children. It's time we stop funding perpetrators of this crime. It's time we stop allowing public money to be spent on educations that do not include the truth of what was done to Indigenous children. And it's time we stop funding schools that refuse to apologize hold accountability and speak the truth to what they have done. I'm directly asking the trustees present, which of you will put forward a motion to advocate to stop this funding? Who will be willing to go beyond orange shirts and the land acknowledgements? It's well past the time for meaningful action. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Uh, really appreciate uh, the time you're taking to also share the challenging experience that you're bringing, but the call to action that is very direct um, to the board and appreciate that. So if you're okay to stay on for a moment, I just want to open up the questions that might come from committee and stakeholders, if you're open to that. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. So uh, to committee uh, members and stakeholders, if you have questions for Marie, please let me know in the uh, comment section, please. So I have a question from Deepak. Uh, I believe that's Krista. Uh, when you're ready, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, the chair. Um, thank you, Marie, for your presentation. Um, I was wondering if uh, in your vision of um, defunding uh, private religious schools, um, if you are taking this request demand to the at the provincial level, since my understanding is that that is that is where that decision comes from, um, and if not, you know what the role of the VSB could be in in making um, your uh, your, I think, valid request known. Uh, and I should say, I think myself personally, I am not speaking on behalf of DPAC. So thank you very much. Thanks for the question, Krista. Marie, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I will be taking it to my MLA, but um, I feel like all levels of government are responsible. All elect elected officials are responsible. Um, the BSB needs to be a leader. Whenever I receive an email or any sort of communication, the first thing that I see is the land acknowledgements. Um, I see Vancouver School Board as a potential ally in this, and I would like to see the school board present itself as an ally through its language. It's an opportunity to be a leader now, and it's time to do the work. Um, and this very important work of reconciliation needs to be done on all levels of government. Thank you for the response, Marie and Krista. Does that help um, 
with your question around the advocacy for the ministry? Yes, thank you. Okay, super. And any other questions or comments for Marie? I have a comment from Trustee Parrott when you're ready. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I want. I just want to briefly describe um, the process at this committee. Trustees, by policy, can't make motions at this committee level. Having said that, um, I'm, I'm, I, for one, and I'm sure that most, most of the, if not all of the trustees, um, would be prepared to, to to take a motion that puts the reconciliation in into action we the vancouver school board i believe already has um sent letters to the ministry asking them not to use public funding for for independent uh, private education institutions i i think that a motion like this being specific would go a long way as well so so even though it's not, you won't see it being moved here. Uh, I hope that you will keep keep in contact uh, for our next board meeting, which is at the end of June, where can motions I, can be put. Sorry, can I speak to that? Um, I, I was only given the opportunity to either speak at a committee or board meeting. There's, a, I would guess, a special rule on this, which I'm not sure if everybody's aware of it. I was quite disappointed. I would love to speak at the board meeting as well. Um, and I know that there, there was a motion put forth about elite private schools, um, but it, it wasn't very, it wasn't advocated properly. Um, we need to continue to do this, especially in light of the recent, um, it, the old motion, sorry, didn't address residential schools. Um, it was just to stop private funding to elites, private schools. Um, I think we can all agree that there's a difference between elite private schools receiving taxpayer funding versus Catholic private schools. The latter is run by and operated by a religious organization that participated in the genocide of Indigenous people. They stole children and subjected them to abuse trauma that is still felt generations later. And I'm asking you to take another go at this, um, to put the work in that needs to be done for their survivors and the Indigenous children. This is also a well-being committee and this Absolutely, the Indigenous children that attend Vancouver schools need to see that Vancouver school is standing, school board is standing up for them and pushing to help them and their relatives and their ancestors get through this trauma. Thank you, Marie, and thanks Thank for referencing. I, I, okay, sorry, go ahead, Trustee Perry. Thank you, Marie. I I, I hear what you're saying. Thanks. And I wanted to thank you, Marie, for referencing the previous motion and the, the need to go further um, based on your presentation and wanted to um, confirm what Trustee Parrott mentioned, which is this committee, as well as the one on Monday, their committees. So a motion wouldn't come forward at a committee directly, but we can, and my job as a chair would be to present this back to the board at the end of the month. And I can reference um, the call to action that you've made. Um, and at that time, the board can decide um, at any time uh, what kind of recommendation or motion would be made. Um, and then it could come back to a future committee or be dealt with at the board. So uh, hopefully I can follow up in writing maybe if the process could be made clearer so that you could know how to follow the item and see the follow up. Great. Yeah. great. Really appreciate your time, Marie. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I just want to check if uh, Lena Young is on the line. Um, that would be our last delegation. Lena? Okay, hey, Lena, I think I can see you there. I'm just wondering if you could unmute uh, and maybe we can hear you. Hi, yes, I'm here. Perfect. When you're ready, you have five minutes. Great. Thank you for allowing me to speak. And again, I appreciate um, the opportunity on the ancestral lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tisoth peoples. I'm speaking as continuation of the Hamburg delegation to request that we save the enrichment programs. Um, and I want to speak to my personal 
situation. We chose to uproot our family from the Okanagan to access school resources that were available in the Lower Mainland for one child of three. Um, and she had medical and learning disabilities. The same thing for the other two kids who were on the other end of the spectrum, in other words, being more capable. We did lots of research, but found not comparable schooling in the Okanagan. Hence, we decided to live basically a double life with one parent always commuting to be with the rest of the family on weekday or on weekends only. We are in a fortunate position to be able to do this and felt strongly enough about the importance of the challenge program and the honors classes and other enrichment programs to make this difficult decision to basically split the family in two in order to meet our children's educational needs. We wanted them to grow and learn to their full potential and to be included with their peers. However, with most families, this would not be possible. And for the VSB to pull the honors classes could be the straw that breaks the camel's back. It would certainly have been for us as our son, who is in the grade 10 challenge program, was struggling, struggling emotionally prior to the challenge program and finally flourished after he found his tribe with the honors classmates. Having been through both the private and public school systems, I feel strongly that these, problem, these programs must remain in place, um, especially if they have nowhere else to turn that's within their means. I've seen both ends of the spectrum of kids' abilities and believe that a child who is more capable is not necessarily a blessing. It can come with its own set of challenges and become a learning disability in itself when a child does not have the proper educational opportunities, especially when these kids have IEPs That's as well. Teachers cannot possibly differentiate or adapt their teaching styles to 30 different students in the same classroom. They have to teach to the majority of, by, and by not optimizing education, to every child you are in fact excluding those on the fringe i.e. those with either official learning disabilities or IEPs that include their different learning abilities. This does not meet the new curriculum design's goals of equitable access and inclusiveness. These types of programs help promote STEM. In fact I'm actually a 1989 Hamber alumni who took AP classes and honors classes in the early 80s. I came from a family that did not have the socioeconomic means to participate in extracurricular activities that the VSB is telling us that these kids who would have been in honors classes should partake in that promote such interest in the above. And it was a strong academic program in Hamburg that helped pave the way for me to eventually be where I am today. So I have two private practices in dentistry, plus I consult in oral oncology at VC Cancer Agency. So how do you expect families who with kids who are interested in STEM in Vancouver, who are in the most expensive city in the world to live in, to also have to worry about more expenses to meet their children's needs, when in fact, it should be the public school system that we have been relying on to help support their learning and well-being. In fact, an um, interesting side note, my sister is actually a special resources teacher in the public school system in the Lower Mainland. And when we were researching whether to move and enroll our daughter within the, um, with the learning disability in a private school, she said yes, as the public system did not have the resources to support different kids. I find it pretty disappointing and a sad state of affair when teachers some teachers don't have faith in the public system. So why would the VSB take away a program that is one of the few resources available? Yes, I do ag agree with everyone having the chance to access these programs, but only if you qualify. Similar to if you apply to a post-secondary program, you need to meet prerequisites, if not exceed them. The current application process is fair for the honors programs and other mini schools, in my humble opinion, if it is available to all to apply. The cancellations of the math and science honors classes do not affect our family directly now, as my son, who is in grade 10 in the challenge program, is just finishing up both these classes. While my youngest daughter is in the program specifically for the critical thinking and humanities aspect. However, I'm speaking on behalf of the future families 
who would miss out on educational opportunities if these changes escalate. If the VSB had made these type of changes without being transparent at the time our family had been making decisions for children's schooling, it would have drastically impacted our lives as we had also made life altering decisions, house, business, friends, splitting up the family. Imagine all the families who may not have a voice at this meeting and the impact the board's decisions would have on a child's emotional, social, and physical and financial well-being. It would have been definitely negative and devastating for us. So why would VSB mislead students and their families on a false path when it was known well ahead of time what your intentions were? How do we explain to our children that figures of authority did not tell them the truth all along and all their planning were for naught? How do we assuage all their disappointments and anxiety about the challenges that lay ahead after having made the now wrong choice in honors programs? How would you feel if you were told one thing one minute and the very next thing have the rug pulled out from under you? How can we right this ship? I ask that you help us save the enrichment and honors classes. And I also ask if we, if that is too late to reverse that decision to have better communication with all stakeholders, including parents and their children, as well as give more adequate notice. I'm not speaking just for my family and the immediate families that are coming into Hamber, but um, also on behalf of the 250 people who signed our change.org. Thank petition. you. Thank Thanks, you. Lena. I just want to leave time in case there's questions yeah, sure. and your time is up. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to ask any committee members if you have questions or comments for our speaker. And just give me one moment here. I've got one question from Deepak, uh, when you're ready. Yes, thank you through the chair. Um, thank you, Lena, for your presentation. And I think my <clears throat> comment slash question applies to all the um, presentations we've just heard on enrichment. Um, here's kind of what I'm taking away from the situation. And so my question is, please feel free to correct me if I'm getting this wrong. Um, but it seems to me that, you know, these enrichment programs are school-based programs and the schools have the discretion to decide whether they're going to be offered. But what's happened is that, you know, websites have advertised them or advertised is the wrong word, informed parents about them. Parents have made decisions to move, to forego other options, et cetera. And the communication about cancellation of them has not happened. So people have uh, parents have, you know, trust has really been lost in that process of um, a lack of communication there. Um, so there's sort of the the trust communication decision making problem. And then there's also the problem of like, well, how are these kids, their their needs for um, for being challenged could be met in a, in a redesigned curriculum that doesn't include these, um, these particular streamed options. Um, and I, I think that in the long term, that's the big question, right? Is is if if the writing is on the wall and if these enrichment programs are, you know, not sort of protected by the district, but they really are ad hoc at the discretion of the schools, um, what does the new curriculum design say about challenging students and how does that play out? And can that information get to parents? Um, so Lena, feel free to comment on anything I've said. I realize it was probably more comment than question, but it's really, I'm trying to summarize the sort of big picture. Yes, I agree with you with respect to the big picture. It's trust in the higher ups not, has, has not only been lost um, with the parents, from the parents, but our children who we've been telling trust in the higher ups, trust that the public education system and the school board has your best interests in heart, but to be told one thing and then the very next day, literally, it was like two days later, <laughs> we were told about the math class being pulled. So who are we supposed to believe? <laughs> so I'd like to have, if, if we can't reverse this decision, then at least um, give us advance notice and have us participate in that conversation, not tell us with two days notice and say we have no input. And number two, um, uh, we were told it wasn't a school decision and we have it in writing that it was directed by the school board. So I'm getting some incongruent comments 
during this meeting. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Lena, and thank you, uh, Krista, for your question and comments. Uh, any other questions or comments from stakeholders on the committee? Okay, I'm uh, not seeing any, and want to thank you, Lena, um, for your presentation and for your time this evening and also sharing your family's experience. Um, this definitely uh, came up in a couple delegations, and it sounds like we have some follow-up um, with the committee in general and on this topic, so appreciate uh, the time you've taken to share. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right, and so for our next item, uh, which is a set of information items, I'd like to welcome Jody Langwa, Rose McKenzie, Dave Delorme, and Chaz Desjardins for a Hope Elementary update. Thank you. So this evening, um, it is my great pleasure to be able to um, provide you uh, with a different little sort of a presentation tonight. So in your package you have before you um, an uh, update that uh, provides information on the actions taken since the most recent review was held in 2019. Um, this review does tie directly to our strategic plan through Bull 1, which is to engage our learners through innovative and teaching, teaching and learning practices, as well as through Goal 3 to create a culture of care and shared social responsibility. Um, as a bit of background, it was in the spring of 2019 that the review of Indigenous Focus School Akpe was conducted by an independent reviewer, Davida Marsden, or Don Marsden, sorry. <laughs> At the completion of the review, seven recommend recommendations were made. They are commit to Indigenous methodologies, strengthen commitments to academic excellence and Indigenous focused learning, Recognize populations' needs and strengthen commitments to empowered, engaged, and strength-based learning. Strengthen the sense of community. Recognize and support equity and social determinants of learning. And demonstrate environmental care, as well as commit to us boundary students and land-based learning. So you do have the report in front of you. There are many examples included within that report of what is going on at Akpe. But when I talked it over with some of our Indigenous staff, the principal of the school, we decided that, um, you know, it's easy to read the words, but we felt it would be far more impactful if it just showed you what the kids are doing. So what I would like to do in a moment is um, we're going to present you with a video taken of demonstrating how the kids are doing at Akpe. And following that video, um, I'm going to hand it over to the principal of the school, Rose McKenzie, followed by our district vice principal of Indigenous education, David Delorme, and then uh, our district principal for Indigenous education, Chaz Desjardins, will wrap it up. So without further ado, um, can I cue in the video, please? I think there's a problem with no sound. Yes, there should be sound. And I do know that they tried this before. <laughs> Sarah, can we back it up till we can get some sound? Sarah? I'm just wondering if we could get a little IT support. Thank you. <laughs> it's too good with the sound. You can't miss the sound. Yeah, thanks, Sarah and Jody. Uh, so it looks like we're just queuing it back up. That's great. I do know that they've tried this out more and it does work. Sorry, we'll, thank we'll you. Try Sorry about that. Again. My apology. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Sarah.
There we go. Gaklik Arwen, who Gaki Gaki Vancouver, who any Tunaha Kasuka Click Richard, Kamaka Click Michelle. Part of the identity project that Division One had completed was a, a fundamental piece is the sense of belonging and their identity of knowing who they are and where they come from. And that's a message that we particularly deliver to our students is always know who you are and where you come from. I think my personal strength is my compassion. Um, one thing I enjoy about my culture is it's in HAGA, um, is where we all, all, all of my nation comes together. Um, one thing I enjoy about my community is hanging out with my friends and something I, and things that I enjoy learning about is math and history and different cultures, pathologies. As part of teachings here at Hakpe, we acknowledge the diversity of Indigenous peoples. Part of the teachings that we have included in the identity projects is the teachings around the medicine wheel, which is brought um, from our Cree Ojibwe nations. Um, we have been covering Joyce Perriot's medicine book as well as her work booklet. Here I'll be introducing Jumana. What is a medicine wheel? A medicine wheel is a foundation of teaching and learning that shows how different parts of life are connected and balanced. The symbol of four colors is in a circle represents the interconnectivity of all aspects of a person's relationship with themselves, others, and natural and spiritual worlds. This book teaches us about the medicine wheel from an Ojibwe perspective. That means lead Thunderbird man. I'm taking the tobacco from X Bay School to do pipe ceremony a few days down the road. This is the traditional Nehio Cree way of doing things when we ask for a ceremony to happen in the future to always present tobacco 
to the person that's going to do the ceremony, pipe ceremony. Guardian cat? Guardian cat um, attacks all the animals. The bear wasn't helping at all. He went back to catching his fish and said sorry and helped him, the wolf. This is the kitty cat. This is the picture. It's Otter, um, wolf, cat, the deer twins, and the bear. What's this bird called? Um, it's called the guardian spirits. My traditional name is New Magishiwab, to see like a golden eagle, and I'm really honored to be in your school. How many people have played the drum before? On behalf of x students and staff, we acknowledge to work, live, and play on the unceded traditional lands of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, Coast Salish people. Division 2 did the assembly about respect. Today, the like Lacey mentioned, the Division Two did uh, an assembly on respect, and what we did was um, we had the seven grandfather teachings uh, over the course of the whole year. As you can see in the back here, the Division Two did a lot of um, artwork on respect, and it, it talks about uh, acknowledging the different cultures. This was a great opportunity for Division Two to extend their thinking into different cultures. How it's up. So you're going to do an activity with uh, Miss Val and Mrs. Austin, and they are getting uh, ready for you to learn all about the button blanket. You know how our hereditary chiefs, they put on blankets in our ceremony. Um, my traditional name is Galdak. Um, it's a baby name in our feast house. I'm from the house of Delgamuf. Um, my grandmother's name is Lucky Gi'i. And in the past, we used to use cedar and uh, fur, hide from moose or deer. And they used to use shells or uh, we have abalone from the northwest coast, Prince Rupert area. Uh, we have abalone. We have these little shells called dentillion. 
shells. They're very special because dentillion, people had to dive really far in the bottom of the ocean or the bay to get the dentillion shells. So they're very special. Hi, my name is Brady. Um, my mom's name is Stacy. My dad's name is Gagan. My biological dad's name is Brent. My family comes from Saskatchewan, Saskatoon. And I'm feeling good on my relations. Hi, um, my name's Lacey, my dad, my mom's name is Denise, my dad's name is Mark, and my brother's name is Turner, and my family comes from up north, and I'm feeling good. Hi, just go. So, Chair, if I may now bring um, in Principal Rose McKenzie to start off uh, doing a little explanation about what you just saw. Thank you. Rose, over to you. Thank you, Jody. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. So, uh, good evening, Tayyip. Um, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here. However, our staff have had heavy hearts these past weeks. Because as a school, we have come together numerous times to remember and honour the 215 children buried near a residential school in Kamloops. We've been drumming, singing, wearing orange and setting our prayers, and we'll continue to do so as long as we need. Not to my one heart, one mind, together. This is what the elder um, Shane Point had said to us earlier in the week. So we're keep very mindful of that. So I want to thank our wonderful staff for their hard work and their commitment to our students. They actively seek ways to engage and empower our students. I raise my hands to our families and the PAC who send their, their children to our school. We thank you for your unwavering support and guidance at the school. As well, the community supports such as adopt a school over the years have been significant and I would be remiss in not acknowledging their contributions. Our school, as mentioned in the report uh, from Jody, is guided by the holistic learning framework created by Dr. Joanne Archibald and others, and was developed a number of years ago with the school community at the time. We are and continue to refer to holism framework of emotional, spiritual, intellectual, and physical. We view our school as a possibility space in order to transform education and reimagine learning by moving away from a Eurocentric approach to one in which we decolonize and emphasize Indigenous ways of learning, being, and doing. It is embedded in everything we do. In our school, we center the experiences of our students, our families, and the staff who identify as Indigenous. The centering is far from places of weakness or problematic issues, but instead, it is a centering of deep cultural wealth and community wisdom. 
we actively engage the key principles outlined in the Aboriginal Enhancement Agreement of Belonging, Mastery, Culture and Community, and which is reflected in the district's deeper learning work of identity, mastery and creativity, as they are paramount in us creating an inclusive learning environment in which our students feel empowered and safe. They thrive and flourish. Chaz, I'm sorry, but I loved a quote that you just tweeted out today. We teach Indigenous brilliance and success as much as you teach Indigenous suffering and trauma. That is what we remember in this school. So we continue the heart work of Nachma, one heart, one mind. I like to thank the district and in particular the Indigenous Education Department, Amanda White, our knowledge keeper, Taz, Chaz Desirle, district principal, and David DeLorme, district vice principal. I really appreciate this, our school and, and myself, we really appreciate your support these past few years. You have all been instrumental in keeping our school focused and grounded. Thank you very much, Hachka. And David uh, will now uh, share the work that we've done with the grandfather teachings. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rose. Um, can you hear me? It's good. All right, thank great. Um, so, Tansay, um, David DeLorme. I am the district vice principal of Indigenous Education. I'm Métis Cree, originally from the traditional lands referred to as Treaty 6 territory in Saskatchewan. I'm very honored to be a visitor here on this land. Uh, the Seven Grandfather teachings have been a part of the Indigenous culture and the community for many generations. We have adopted these teachings within HAPE to support all of our students and to help guide them throughout their academic career. The Seven Grandfathers teaches us to live a good life, one with virtues and guiding principles that shape the individual. We continue to teach these lessons of love, respect, courage, truth, honesty, humility, and wisdom to all of our students. These teachings align perfectly with five of the seven recommendations which were shared within the HAPE Independent Review document from 2019. They help to build relationships with families and students while providing an education that is reflective of this community. HAPE is a choice school and people are drawn to it because of what it stands for and the staff that support them. The Indigenous ways of knowing and being and the First Peoples principles of learning is woven throughout the school culture. Students that attend the school respect these beliefs and teachings while creating their own space within their classrooms. We have built a sense of community with a strong educators with, within a supportive and structured place for all to learn and to grow. We offer programming that others do not with an Indigenous focus for all of our students. We lead through ceremony and respect the teachings of all nations. We want all of our students to- From my own experience working in the school, Hape is a shining example of what it means to center Indigenous holism, pedagogy and practice within the school. The school has seen enormous growth since the recommendations of 2019 and uh, you know Rose mentioned transformation and holism and really fostering Indigenous brilliance and I've witnessed that uh, in the work uh, that I've seen being done at that school. The young people that you witnessed in the video are evidence of that and when I think about the enhancement agreement that school has created a community, a culture of belonging with that because of the cultural teachings and the seven grandfather teachings or the seven sacred teachings as they're known. The students know how to be with and among once one another because those values are fostered every day in the school by everyone who works in that school school. So when I think about, you know, the young people, they're in the center around them, you know, are their parents around them, are their communities around them, are their nations, this is a good example. Um, how we need to think about being when we're in that school is that we're all related, that we're in relationship to one another. The teacher is just not the teacher. 
the principal is just not the principal. The um, IW, IWs and or SSBs that work in that school, they now become the aunties, the uncles, and they wrap around. So the video that you witnessed is a prime example of the love. And that is just one of the teachings of the seven sacred teachings. And so I'd just like to, you know, raise my hands to Rose and David for their good work, for really centering that within the school. And I'll tell you one thing that I, I'm, I'm well, there are many things that I'm proud of about about that school, but that young man, Brady, in the, in the video, when I was um, asked to work alongside Rose, when I first became principal in September 2019, I spent a lot of time at the school and got to know all the kids and loved being there. I'm a secondary trained educator, but I would in a heartbeat go into an elementary school because they're just amazing. They're precious. And uh, Brady, that child is so full of energy. And uh, just to see him sit there in the circle and introduce himself, that just really makes my heart sing. That really makes me feel very proud. And I know each and one of those students in that school are able to do that because that teaching has been grounded in the cultural circle and the teachings. And uh, I'm just again, I think, uh, Rose, you have done an amazing job and David as well. And again, hi Chicken and much gratitude for your good work. Thank you. Thank you. And just confirming back uh, with you, Jody, that was uh, the team's presentation. Yes, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Chaz, David, Rose, and Jody, um, for sharing so much of your work, your passion, dedication, um, and thoughtfulness uh, with us. I'd like to open this up for questions and comments from committee members. I've got a question starting with Trustee Fraser and then over to Joanne for a comment. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you to all the presenters and uh, everyone behind the uh, video as well. And I, I, you know, picked up, you know, I'm, I'm learning uh, from the work that's being brought to us at the committee. So I'm learning about the change from Eurocentric to Indigenous focus at the school. And I, I picked some of that from, up from the presentation. And I'm curious, I'm not sure if um, this is too specific a question for people who are in the meeting. I'm curious about how the coding was done with an in Indigenous lens. Um, and if, if you can't answer that now, then that's fine. It, maybe it could come back later. Thanks, Trustee Fraser. And Jody or anyone from the team, would you like to speak to that? I'd be happy to ask either David or Rose as they're school-based. Uh, yes, um, uh, through the chair, I'll uh, respond to that. Um, we have to refer that back to Kyla Shields, our resource teacher, teacher librarian, although David was there, maybe he can respond, but um, I don't know specifically uh, what was targeted with the Indigenous piece, but um, we can certainly go get back to you on that. Well, thank I can you. just. Oh, thanks, Dave. Sorry, I, I can just share it because I was in with the lesson. I think that it was around coding, but the focus was also around storytelling. So the focus was more uh, with storytelling, um, but she used coding in order to get the teachings across. And there was um, a lot of uh, build up to the beginning of that. So there was lots of information that was shared with the students uh, before the actual coding activity. I don't know if that answers your question. But that's kind of what happened on that in that lesson. Yes, thank you. And I hadn't, you know, I think of coding as something more technical and not uh, related to storytelling. So thank you very much. Thanks, David. And over to Joanne. 
Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to take this opportunity to um, uh, thank the district and the staff and the students for sharing that video. I think that it's been um, uh, a challenging time and a challenging year, and to see uh, the learning that happens, um, you know, in action on the ground. We haven't been able to come into schools as, you know, part of uh, the, the the COVID uh, protocols and everything this year. So it's really great to see kind of what is happening on on the ground. Um, and I know that, um, you know, as, as VESTA, we're privileged to have a couple of uh, the teachers on our executive um, that can kind of tell us what's happening on the ground. And it's great. Um, and, uh, you know, we have uh, motions regarding um you know, um, around the United um, Nations Declaration um, and, and calls to action around those pieces. And so I'll share that uh, with the trustees uh, after this meeting. Uh, but just wanted to say uh, thank you very much uh, for sharing. And um, it's been a privilege and an honor to get to uh, watch and uh, be part of that in some small way. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that, Joanne, and would really appreciate your follow up there. Um, so just checking for any further comments or questions. I've got Trustee Parrott and then Marissa. Thank you, Chair. I've said it uh, before, but I'll keep saying it. I, I have an image of Occupy in a different place. And my place has a school uh, built out of cedar in a place with, with trees that can be explored, maybe even a creek that can be opened up or uh, that currently exists where place-based learning can really happen. Um, it, it can happen at, at Hastings and Victoria, but it's not certainly not the best location for an, an Indigenous school, I think. So uh, that's, that's my vision of... Uh, Okay. Thanks for your comment, Trustee Parrott. Uh, and just over to Marissa. Oh, I just wanted to say that that was really amazing. That's all. Yeah, it's great to hear it uh, vocally just for folks who um, are online. Thank you for sharing. Um, okay, so not seeing any further questions or comments from committee members. Um, would like to really uh, extend uh, gratitude and thanks to the whole team, uh, Jody, Rose, David, and Chaz, for your presentation on behalf of um, the Hope uh, update. Thank you. And so we've got item 2.2 here uh, presented by Aaron Davis and Allison Ogden on the secondary school model. Uh, welcome to the both of you when you're ready. Hi. Awesome. Thanks, Chair Reddy. So I'm going to be getting us started today. Uh, we wanted to come back uh, to the committee and just talk about what the uh, structure and plans are for secondary for the coming school year, 2021-2022. Um, so we're just going to go through just a few uh, pieces of information to set the context uh, around what the engagement process was uh, that informed the decision around those structures uh, to, to talk specifically about the structure. Uh, and then give some definitions because there's some uh, new new things that we're going to be doing next year and want to make sure that folks um, have an understanding of what those are, what that what fit flexible instruction time is all about. Uh, and we will provide some information around what other metro districts are doing and, and perhaps have time for some questions. So just to go through uh, quickly, and, and this has, uh, I believe, come to this committee before, um, or if not different stakeholder groups, but the, the engagement process that we undertook um, really, you know, over the course of this year, listening to the feedback and the learning that was done um, as we moved through the quarter model uh, during this time. But, I, but even prior to that, there was a student forum in 2019, so pre-pandemic, where we brought together students from all over the district to talk about what would meet their needs in terms of learning. Uh, and out of that came some really interesting themes which were echoed in the engagement and, and the feedback that we received this year. So at the time uh, in 2019, students really were asking for flexibility uh, to suit their learning needs and that learning, as we've heard, is not one size fits all, and they wanted to have options for flexibility to support that, and space for some one-on-one -on -one connections uh, with staff and students. Uh, 
Director of Instruction Davis and myself also met with uh, VDSC uh, and got feedback from those students as well and again representatives from all of our different uh, secondary schools and what the theme that that emerged from those conversations was uh, this year that fewer courses at one time had been really positive and that was something they'd like to see moving in into the future. We also looked at information collected from teachers through a survey that was done um, earlier uh, December, January time uh, to see what was working really well for the educators in buildings, um, what they really wanted to kind of bring forward with them from the learning from this year. And what emerged from that was, you know, the majority of teachers indicating that, that teaching fewer courses and fewer students at one time um, allowed for some really valuable connections. Uh, they did highlight having some flexibility in, in, in time during uh, the day to connect with students and, and folks definitely appreciate the smaller class sizes. We worked with secondary administrators as well for feedback from them uh, and where they communicated a desire uh, for a semester system with some sort of flexible uh, learning time built in and consistency across our district. We have uh, 18 secondary schools and our Vancouver alternate schools, so a number of different sites. We looked at uh, information from uh, DPAC survey and I, uh, we also went to DPAC meetings and received a, a lot of feedback uh, from parents here uh, at the and and reading through all that, uh, listening to what people were communicating, parents certainly communicating that they would like to see a return to full-time in-person learning. Uh, there was a, uh, an appreciation of what teams uh, had brought to be able to support student learning. And again, uh, that group uh, of parents and guardians indicated that their children having fewer courses at one time to focus on um, had, some, had some benefits. Uh, and lastly here, uh, we did work with other metro districts to sort of see where they were going with their planning. Um, and, and I know that Director of Instruction Davis will outline later some of the specifics around it, but uh, certainly at the time when we were when we were having those conversations, folks were looking to uh, run uh, schedules that had fewer courses at one time and incorporating some flexible instruction into those schedules. We also consulted with our Indigenous Education Department, uh, learning services, education services and career programs to make sure that the conversations uh, that we were having were informed by the needs of those folks as well. So looking forward to next year, we are moving into a semester model. So four courses from September to January and four courses from February to June. It, we are planning uh, for full-time in-person learning and currently waiting on um, any informational updates from the Ministry of Education and our provincial health officer around uh, COVID and how that would inform that planning, but definitely um, the full-time in-person learning is the, uh, the plan. And we are also planning to have 100 minutes of flexible instruction time per week, which uh, we'll talk about the definition in just a, a second, but I do want to kind of give everybody a visual representation of what this schedule will look like. So um, four courses a day, that flexible instruction time, it's 100 minutes a week, it's going to be broken up into two 50-minute blocks, one on Tuesday morning, one on Thursday afternoon to balance out the week and to balance out um, part-time staff and, and also just to have a balance for students as well so that at the, at the end of the year we will make sure that all of our classes um, have had equal uh, or equitable numbers of instructional minutes. So that's a bit of a graphic of what that looks like and I, with that I will turn it over to uh, Aaron to talk about FIT. Thank you, Allison, and uh, good evening, committee. Thank you. Uh, pleasure to be back and uh, sharing information with you. So I want to take a few moments and just talk about what is flexible instructional time. Uh, its in core purpose is to support student learning. It's also really important to know that this is instructional time. It is not prep time for uh, staff unless it's specifically scheduled. So during flexible instructional time, our school is open. So those two red blocks that you saw in the previous slide, the school is open, students are attending the building, they don't need to leave, and our teachers are on site available to work with students. So teachers and departments, uh, school departments and administrators are in the process right now of organizing what will flexible instructional time look like in their school schedules. That is, how will it be utilized? There is some learning that needs to happen here with our students and with our staff, 
Uh, and so because we have 18 secondary schools that are all slightly different, although the schedule is the same, they are making sure that they're uh, laying out usage of flexible instructional time to meet the needs of their learning communities. So here I do have some examples of how that time can be used and will be used. It does provide time for linear learning support. When you have students who are uh, in a semester system and maybe they're struggling with uh, English, they need some support in writing, uh, even though they may have English in semester one, flexible instructional time provides ongoing support for the entire year. So when students uh, get to the end of their English course in January, they still have support for any writing uh, support that they need uh, for their other courses that they're taking in semester two. It also provides an opportunity for personalized non-enrolling instructional time for uh, students around student choice and agency. So for example, our the redesigned curriculum provides lots of opportunity for students to be doing project work um, and students can then take that time to meet during an unscheduled class during FIT and meet with their partners to work through it. So they could go to the library or they could go see the specific teacher that they need support from for that particular learning objective that they're working on. It provides, uh, again, that opportunity for collaboration with their peers. We can also have students that would be participating in weekly classes or activities that may fall outside of their regularly scheduled classes. So again, it's about providing that flexibility and choice. Um, different types of things that could be done, cross-curricular and project-based inquiry, which I've already touched on, an opportunity for enrichment and learning support for individuals or small groups of students. It can help with enhancing language acquisition for our English language learners across all aspects of the curriculum. And it's an opportunity for doing uh, school-wide or grade-wide uh, events during that period. So again, it's instructional time to support uh, flexibility and choice for our students and uh, the buildings are open and keeping our kids in the building uh, with that choice that they have. So uh, what is happening and how does this compare to other metro districts? So West Vancouver, and we do have a number of metro districts that are including flexible instructional time in their schedules. So just for a comparison, we are 100 minutes per week uh, with two sessions per week, as Allison showed in the calendar. West Vancouver will have 160 minutes per week and there's two sessions are scheduled in the afternoon. Burnaby will do 170 minutes per week. They will do 30 minutes first thing in the morning from Monday to Thursday, and then a 50 minute period on Friday. The Richmond School District, they had uh, schools had a choice between three options, one that included 200 minutes of flexible instructional time. Uh, the bulk of Richmond secondary schools will include uh, the flexible instructional time of 200 minutes. There are some that did not. Uh, the Surrey School District, is actually starting in a quarter model. They decided to make that decision because there was uncertainty um, a number of months ago as to whether um, what the guidelines would be coming from the Ministry of Education. So they've moved to a quarter model, which means that they have not specified that they're doing flexible instructional time. But as you can see from this, the Vancouver School District is in alignment with many of our other uh, coast metro districts. There, we've actually shared a lot of this information publicly already. Uh, on the district website. Uh, there's lots of specific information and the details that we have provided that families can look at. They've, it's been published and posted for uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, and it was just because this meeting was a little bit later that we hadn't had a chance to bring it to you in advance of that happening. Uh, however, all of our stakeholders are aware of it and our schools have been communicating to their parent communities about moving forward. So I think it's important just to have a sense then at the end of where do we stand with the Ministry of Education on this part. So from the Ministry of Education website, there is a quote that Allison and I had selected and that is that students benefit from more flexibility and choice of how, when, and where their learning takes place. And this becomes increasingly important as BC takes a more inclusive approach to education and securing all students, regardless of ability or background, benefit from a learning environment tailored to maximize their potential. We believe that the district believes that the model that we're adapting for our secondary schedule for next year attends to this uh, area of focus from the Ministry of Education. It meets the requests of our students, our parents, and our staff who have asked uh, to have some flexibility built into our secondary schedule with fewer courses being taken at one time. And so as a result, the district's really excited that next year's schedule incorporates this flexibility and it remains as a district committed to continuing the work and conversations around structures, 
that best support learning for all of our students. So at this time, Allison and I will take any questions uh, from the committee. Thanks, Allison and Erin, for the update uh, and for returning to uh, share your work so far. So I uh, just want to quickly open up for questions, but also uh, welcome folks to please email further questions. Um, uh, we have a special private board meeting at 7.30, so just want to be mindful of the time and give folks a few minutes before that meeting. Um, so I'll just see if there are any questions or comments in the chat right now. And I've got uh, Trina when you're ready and then followed by John. Thanks so much, Trustee Reddy. Um, and uh, thanks to Allison and Aaron who have um, been incredibly um, available to us, to VSTA, to have discussions around uh, around the secondary schedule. Um, we, I think, have a, a meeting that we hope to have in the next short while uh, to continue those discussions. Uh, I think it's very worthwhile to to stress the degree of change that teachers have experienced at the secondary level and and how that is impacting them. Um, you know, many of our members are very nimble and respond and are able to to handle the many challenges that COVID has brought. And and some of our members are, are it is more challenging and it is challenging for many of us to constantly have uh, the goalpost shifting. And that has been the ex, um, experience of this year with um, the refinements of the the quarter system. So, I mean, I think there is this um, general sort of sense of um, uh, maybe anxiousness around looking ahead to the semester system. Many of our members, I think, are um, uh, curious and uh, see the potential of what, what can come, but many of our members are also concerned that um, after such a, a grueling year that this is going to be another year of more change and more um, revamping how they deliver um, their their programs. And, and so... Um, I just want to put that out there first. Um, I think what is really clear, and although there has been um, information collected uh, through surveys from members, um, there is no um, full um, acceptance of of the move to the semester system. I think uh, members generally are are cognizant of the the concerns with the the sort of health and safety parameters of having a, a smaller cohort and the great de deal of unknown that's still out there. But um, many, many teachers are, are very much um, uh, reticent about uh, committing to the semester system because they are deeply, deeply connected and uh, committed to the, the strength of what the linear system system um, provides also the pace um, um, and the intensity is is really um, softened and uh, a semester system has some real concerns with um, when a prep lands um, and some of this may be mitigated by the fle uh, the flex um, options and the flexibility that could provide but um, that is a real concern of teachers and those that have had experiences teaching semester many um, are a bit um, uh, concerned about returning to a semester because it is very difficult when you are a full-time teacher and, and spend a whole five months without a prep. Um, our part-time teachers have been enormously impacted um, by the quarter system and now still again with the, the part-time system. Vancouver's linear ske uh, schedule of the past has really been um, in many ways a draw uh, for, for individuals who who for whatever reason, personal, for uh, family reasons, for medical reasons, require um, the the um, softer pace, I suppose, of what a linear day one, day two schedule provides, opposed to, to full on same schedule every day for five months. So we are concerned about that. And then also a slightly more nuanced conversation is around our teachers who uh, may be on medical accommodations or requiring uh, supports and getting back to work full time or getting back to their their um their whatever their their uh, FTE is whatever their their schedule is and and how can we provide that in the uh, semester schedule um the only other um well there's a couple of other comments um the teachers, um, secondary teachers are very committed to um, the desire of having fit time 
uh, be a school-based decision. Um, and um, I, although there is um, the the uh, rationale behind a one system for all um, schools um, is understandable in some ways, but I think you know today we saw how um, unique models fit uh, families and kids um, and schools in in different ways. So so uh, fit time, uh, we really would like to see it a school based decision. And that's the only real definitive um, uh, position that uh, Vancouver secondary teachers have at this point. And um, the other piece was um, there is some concern around uh, perhaps minutes and uh, um, instruction and the inequity between um, the the semesters in that we are far exceeding what the minimum is. At this point in time, we only see one um, semester turnaround day and for um, many reasons, um, the this, this system would benefit hugely from a two day uh, semester turnaround. And uh, we believe that is very much still possible and still be compliant to the ministry um, and school act regulations. And um, the, the only other piece around the fit time is uh, just uh, understanding a little bit more fully and, and perhaps this is a conversation that we can take um, to Allison and Erin, but uh, we really don't want it to be a situation where teachers are now um, managing fit time and um, you know managing students in hallways or, or scurrying them off to, to be somewhere and recognizing that there is going to be some lull and flow to that space where every student might not always be somewhere and um, and it might be just working at their locker. That might be a reality for fit time sometimes. Um, and um, so it's getting um, through those discussions, I think, um, with, um, with district management, but then also to our schools to understand um, how fit time can be best utilized, that it's actually uh, a tool of support and not something that is creating more strain to relationships in the school. So um, thanks again to Allison and Aaron for um, their work on this. And there's, there's so many moving parts this year and a lot of additional strain. And um, uh, we, we do uh, from VSTA really appreciate the work they've done and, and hopefully, um, yeah, there is a lot of curiosity and about semester and, and I think we remain hopeful, but a little bit cautious about what we see next year. So thanks, uh, Chair. Thank you, Trina, uh, so much for your feedback and specific comments and to Allison and Aaron for presenting this now so that we could have that uh, feedback and discussion. It is appreciated. Um, I'm sorry, I know that it was David that was next and not John. So just, <laughs> sorry about Thank that. Thank you. Hi, I just wanted to say a few things specifically about FIT. First of all, also, I'd like to give my thanks to Directors Davis and Ogden for the an enormous amount of work that's gone into this and also just a special thank you for paying such close attention to that information that came out of the student forum that predates COVID. Um, I was blessed to be part of that forum and I know I spent some time there with some of the members of the board and and was so happy to see what was going on that day and uh, very excited to see some of the recommendations that came out of that experience that we put so much work into under the direction of of Superintendent Schindel um, come to fruition. So that's been really great. Uh, we're very excited about fit time for our students. Our staff is very excited about fit time for our students. I've been part of about four meetings in the last two days at the school level where we've been making plans for how fit time will function in our school. Um, and uh, you know, we've taken some lessons from those who have more experience than we do in student in student directed learning. Um, and there will be a lot of support for our teachers on implementing fit from the administration community. Uh, I think we're all quite aware that that needs to happen that way. Um, at our school, for instance, we'll be preparing some lessons for teachers uh, for them to deliver to kids at the initial fit sessions that will provide some orientation to how it works. Um, I also just, you know, with referencing some of the things that we've talked about even tonight, uh, some of the things that we're looking to put in our fit time support for ELL learners 
uh, extra opportunities for them to uh, master language, uh, support and enrichment activities for our gifted learners, um, you know, extra time for our IB students, support for our struggling students, um, additional instruction from teachers for kids who need it. We have some really exciting cross-curricular things already starting to happen. A couple that I'll throw out. I know two teachers planning something on the art of science. Those are some visual arts teachers and some science teachers, some French teachers and social studies teachers preparing some things on the history of France. Um, so there's lots of opportunities for us to do some really fun, exciting things that haven't been uh, as easy to do in the past, um, as well as do things like um, assemblies and and some opportunities, particularly with our grade eights, who I'll be working with next year at my school on doing some things around, you know, what does it take to be a successful high school learner? Some metacognitive stuff, some executive functioning stuff, some social emotional learning and some real opportunities to deal with a group of kids who's, who have been through a real trauma with COVID and to, to use what we know about trauma-informed practice uh, to reach our kids. So we're super grateful for that, that time being there. Uh, one of the things that we're gonna do to support that, in fact, at our school is to put some pages into our agenda that allow kids to plan what they'll be doing during the FIT time and to actually write it down and have it, have it looked at um, by an adult. Um, so we're really seeing that fit time as an opportunity for us to empower students to take leadership in their own learning little by little and to prepare them for post-secondary life where they'll essentially have full ownership of their learning. Um, so we're super excited to go and uh, thank you for letting me share that. not my computer's freezing okay <laughs> thank you david i uh, really appreciate your comments um and thank you to allison and aaron for your presentation um i know that there's probably more questions that might arise please do email them trustee fraser you mentioned that you'll email one in um and we can follow up on that uh, so appreciate your flexibility there um, and I did want to say for um, the two items coming up, 2.3 and 2.4, they are written reports in the agenda. Um, a couple, one of the items will come back in September uh, to the board, uh, whereas the second one is for the board, uh, the committee's information. So if you have questions or comments on that, could you please send those in? Um, and I did want to ask Trustee Parrott if you're okay to go next for item 2.5. Sorry, I lost you. Um, yeah, that's fine. Nothing's happening with 2.5 in any case. So. Okay, thanks, Trustee Parrott. And I just want to take a moment to thank Allison and Aaron for your update and for committee questions. So, Trustee Parrott, when you're ready. Oh, um, well, the um, using the voting age um, was. Uh, taken to the student council before COVID and they um, had a straw poll which indicated that the majority didn't support reducing the voting age. So over the last year and a half I have been talking to uh, the student trustee and asking if I could have somebody from Dogwood. The Dogwood Initiative is a is a group that's that's campaigning on on um, reducing the voting age. And the answer I got from one of the co-chairs was that um, they weren't interested in having anybody from the Dogwood Initiative there. And so that's basically where where the issue will stop. Um, so I, I'm not sure. What happens to the motion, but I won't be taking it forward to the board uh, without the support of the Vancouver District Student Council. Well, thanks for the update, Trustee Parrott, on this motion. Uh, really appreciate it. And if there are questions from committee members, including uh, student trustees, to please um, let us know, uh, either by email or if you have a question now, uh, we could at least note the question. Uh, appreciate the update, Trustee Parrott. 
So the last item that uh, we really wanted to make sure we had a chance to hear feedback from uh, was item 3.1, uh, and that is uh, presented by Chris Stanger on the music review update. Um, it is for committee feedback, so we'd just like to welcome Chris, if you're still here, to uh, please share your update and the uh, dialogue that you hope to have with the committee. All right, well, thank you so much uh, for your time tonight. I realize everybody is short of time as you have many things going, and so I'll try to move uh, try to move quickly. And uh, we can go ahead with the next slide, please. So as you know, this is in reference to our strategic plan. The goals are there. Uh, the introduction uh, agenda that I have is to provide a little background. I'll move very quickly through that. Um, and really, this is really for most people's reference where we've been in terms of how this recommendation has come forward and the recommendation coming out of April 14th SLW need meeting uh, was to proceed and put together an engagement process in order to activate recommendation one of the music review which was to uh, develop and submit to the committee for consideration an engagement proposal uh, that would explore mission and vision and a strategic direction for uh, realizing uh, the music reviews uh, goals. Next slide, please. And so um, what I thought I would do is just briefly walk you through a proposed engagement process that would begin uh, in the fall of next year. Uh, we can keep moving along in this slide here. Next one. The background, I think everybody is aware, uh, the music review really contemplated uh, a 10 year timeline of implementation and was organized around four recommendations. Uh, the first one was really that vision, mission and strategic planning process followed by a gradual implementation timeline over years two to 10. Can move ahead, please. Um, so I think maybe what we might do here is just keep going if you don't mind uh, and then I'll get to the nitty gritty. Yeah, so here we go. We'll just pause here. So really what we've contemplated is uh, a, a phased process over the course of the year. During October to December, we'd like to engage uh, stakeholders in an ad hoc working group from VESTA, QP, DPAC, BEPFA and district staff, including our Indigenous Education Department. And we'd like to spend a couple of sessions working on a vision statement. And that is really the why. The why do we want an equitable, comprehensive music program? Why is that important to us in the Vancouver School District? What are the values and beliefs we have around music that we feel are so important that we need to spend that time uh, to teach our children uh, that? Next, please. Uh, so that is really contemplated over two sessions, and those would probably be uh, two lengthy evening sessions where we would work through all of those things, and they would be structured engagement, dialogue, and questions. Folks would have a little bit of homework to do in terms of gathering information from their stakeholders, bringing that back, and then uh, district staff would be charged with the task of collating that information and sharing it back for feedback to the group. We would also do a session on mission, and of course, mission is the really the what of the work that you're going to do. And that would get at a couple of key questions. That is, what is equitable? What is comprehensive? And what is the program? And uh, again, that would be high level, but it would really clarify for all of us what we mean when we talk about the mission, uh, the substance of the music program that we want to provide. Next slide, please. And then uh, in January, we would uh, report out uh, what we've come up with in terms of the draft uh, vision and mission statements for the com committee's consideration. And we would seek a little bit of in input and feedback of whether there needed to be some refining to that. Uh, next slide, please. Then uh, once that work is done, uh, then during between February and March, we would focus on the operational aspects of the strategic plan of implementation. Again, sort of more high level stuff, but for that we would pull together another working group of VESTA, VEPFA, and the key operational folks involved. So employee services, educational services, or educational department. And the key issues there are not going to be new ones to anyone who's um, participated in the discussions about the music review. It would focus on space, 
staffing considerations, prep time delivery model, uh, resource supplies, professional learning, curriculum development, timelines over the course of years two to 10. Next slide, please. And at the end of that work in about April, uh, again, we would report back uh, on the first recommendation work that we had done to the committee and uh, look for their feedback uh, on the next stage of that. Um, next slide, please. So uh, based on the input and feedback received from June 9th, um, uh, the staff will finalize the engagement plan and put the timelines together, which we've been roughing out and uh, starting to map out. Uh, and then we would be looking forward to activate that in October of the upcoming school year. That was a very quick tour of, uh, of those items. Thank you, Chris. Really appreciate uh, your presentations always, and we will have you first on the agenda next time. Uh, and just want to open up for uh, any initial comments and questions from committee members uh, on Chris's presentation regarding this uh, music review and recommendation one. We have a couple minutes here. Chris, if I could ask, um, in terms of getting feedback from uh, stakeholder groups that may have to go back, like, for example, for parents or for um, staff groups to go back to their members, would you be able to receive those comments until the next time we meet? Or do you want to have a decision more or less structured by the board meeting or sort of what's your timeline? Yeah, I think, um, you know, really where we are now and where we sort of left it at the last meeting is there was um, sort of board approval to go ahead with the engagement process. And so I guess um, feedback um, on on the sort of draft overview shape of what we're mapping out here, uh, if that seems uh, satisfactory to people. Of course, there's a lot of, you know, um, details to put together, which uh, which we definitely have been putting together. Um, and certainly as we move into the upcoming school year, uh, I would be putting out significantly more detailed communication to the stakeholder groups regarding uh, how to select members to participate in the process and then the nuts and bolts of what kind of commitment they would have to make, what the structure of it would look like and what level of kind of homework uh, they would need to do uh, with their stakeholder groups. Um, just one example would be, you know, when we talk about the why, uh, the vision, uh, what are the values and beliefs we have about music that we want to make sure that we incorporate into our vision, um, I'll be giving folks a guided question to take back to their stakeholder groups to, um, to work with their groups ahead of coming to that vision meeting uh, so that they will have been able to have gathered that feedback and bring it forward at the time. We'll also spend some time, of course, bringing forward all of the details from the music review. There was much, a lot of survey work done and a whole lot of content that I'll have to kind of front load people with as well as we work that, through that process. Sure, if I'm unmuted. Thanks, Chris, uh, for that context. And I recognize there's uh, support and uh, enthusiasm for the next steps in the chat. So really appreciate the details you've offered there in terms of what the next steps look like. Um, I'm just trying to go back to the chat here to see if there are any final thoughts. Sorry, it's very slow. Okay, and thanks, uh, David Nelson, got your message. Um, thanks. Okay, um, and so I want to thank you, Chris, for your presentation and for keeping us up to date and engaged in this process um, as you proceed. It is greatly appreciated. Um, and then also thanks to Rob and Jody for your flexibility for the next uh, time that we can ask these uh, submit questions by email and then Rob welcome you back for the next meeting um, and I wanted to just close by thanking everyone uh, for bearing with uh, me uh, and all the presentation and information that was so important tonight and also one of our last uh, the last committee meeting um, for us this year uh, I had a couple words of acknowledgement for Macy Louis um, who is actually retiring from the district and has helped this committee um, every time uh, in terms of getting us set up and ready to go. So a uh, few words here for you, Macy. Uh, thank you for your hard work in supporting learning services and education services. Um, your support ranged um, 
from supporting staff, including teachers, district management team, and a number of committees, including this one, the SEAC, uh, Education Change Advisory, and District Professional Development. And you've also been instrumental in helping to coordinate Project Chef, Roots of Empathy, and IB support. So uh, great thanks to you, Macy, and wishing you the best in your retirement. So I'm not sure, uh, sorry about that. Um, Thank you everyone for joining this meeting this evening and uh, for bearing uh, with some of the freezing. So on behalf of Jennifer, it's Suzanne. She's frozen again. She just sent me a text. So thanks to everyone from Jennifer. Um, she really appreciates everybody being here for this evening and for all of your contributions. Wishes you all a happy summer and looks forward to working with you come September. Have a great evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, can, um, and congratulations to Maisie, but uh, can we have some information requests for next meeting for next year?